This is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 301. Do good. There are some people in our church community who never seem to stop doing good. Whenever I see them, they are serving or washing up, praying for someone, encouraging others, offering to take food to the sick, or doing some other kind act. They give generously to the work of the church. They do all these things with such grace and enthusiasm. I am always encouraged and challenged by their example. They never seem to tire of doing good. In our society, the term do-gooder has become pejorative. It's used as an insult. But doing good should not be seen in this way. Jesus went around doing good. St. Paul writes to Titus, Remind the people to be ready to do whatever is good. His desire is that those who have trusted in God devote themselves to doing what is good. To quote John Wesley, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. From Psalm 119 I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commands of my God. Sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Uphold me, and I will be delivered. I will always have regard for your decrees. You reject all who stray from your decrees, for their delusions come to nothing. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore I love your statutes. My flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. Do good, not evil. The opposite of doing good is doing evil. The psalmist is determined to do good. That's why he says, Away from me, you evildoers. The evildoers are double-minded. They stray from God's decrees and are deceitful. Choose to avoid evil and do good. Love God's words. God is your refuge and shield. Put your hope in his word. I'll give total allegiance to your definitions of life. The psalmist writes, Sustain me according to your promise, and I shall live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Our hope being deferred is bad enough. The book of Proverbs says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Bring your hopes before God today and pray like the psalmist that your hopes will not be dashed. Lord, I love your words. Help me to live by them, to stay away from doing evil and to do good. Today I bring my hopes to you again. Do not let my hopes be dashed. New Testament from Titus 3 Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, 
and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zanus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way, and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Always be ready to do good. There is such a striking contrast between Paul's life before he experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ and his life afterwards. And I relate to this in my own experience. Paul writes, We too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. However, Jesus utterly transforms us. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Doing good is a response to God's kindness and love for us. We often think of the kindness of our family and friends, but God is infinitely more kind than that. If God has been so kind to you, it's a natural response for you to be kind to others out of his kindness and love. God has not only forgiven you, he has also given you the Holy Spirit. He gave us a good bath and we came out of it new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Saviour Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. It's the Holy Spirit who enables you and empowers you to do good. Therefore, Paul can write of the kind of lives we are now to lead. Remind the people to respect the government and to be law-abiding. This is our civil responsibility, to obey the laws of the country, unless they're contrary to God's law. But obedience and submission to rulers and authorities is not enough. We must be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility towards everyone. He urges them twice more to devote themselves to doing what is good. It is striking that Paul's focus here seems to be on their relationships with other people. Paul is encouraging an other-focused mindset rooted in humility, truthfulness and consideration for others. While you are to be motivated by love, sometimes it is by actually serving others that you learn to love them. Even after you've been reborn... And renewed by the Holy Spirit, there will be temptations to get sidetracked and become unproductive. Don't get involved in incessant arguments. Paul writes, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Paul is concerned that the Christians in Crete be distinct and different from the culture in which they live. He writes, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. You live out what you believe in front of a watching world. If we are lazy and unproductive, it will be noticed. You are to reflect the kindness and love of God our Saviour as you do good. Doing good and living a productive life does not necessarily mean that you need to change your job. When I was practicing as a lawyer, I remember considering whether God was calling us to ordination in the Church of England. I was very struck by the mention of Zenas the lawyer. It reminded me that if I were to stop practicing as a barrister, it was not because there was anything wrong with being a Christian lawyer. Wherever you are in life, and whatever your job or ministry, it is possible to go around doing good. Lord, thank you so much for the way in which you've transformed my life. Help me to lead a productive life and like Jesus, to go around doing good. Old Testament from Lamentations 1 and 2 How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. 
How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters, her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly, and so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her, for they have all seen her naked. She herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was none to comfort her. Look, Lord, on my affliction for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look around and see. Is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord brought on me in the day of his fierce anger? From on high he sent fire, sent it down into my bones. He spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He made me desolate, faint all the day long. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung on my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has given me into the hands of those I cannot withstand. The Lord has rejected all the warriors in my midst. He has summoned an army against me to crush my young men. In his winepress the Lord has trampled virgin daughter Judah. This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has decreed for Jacob that his neighbors become his foes. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. The Lord is righteous, Yet I rebelled against his command. Listen, all you peoples, look on my suffering. My young men and young women have gone into exile. I called to my allies, but they betrayed me. My priests and my elders perished in the city while they searched for food to keep themselves alive. See, Lord, how distressed I am. I am in torment within, and in my heart I am disturbed, for I have been most rebellious. Outside the sword bereaves. Inside there is only death. People have heard my groaning, but there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my distress. They rejoice at what you have done. May you bring the day you have announced so that they may become like me. Let all their wickedness come before you. Deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my sins. My groans are many and my heart is faint.
Lamentations chapter 2 How the Lord has covered daughter Zion with the cloud of his anger. He has hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Without pity the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath he has torn down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He has brought her kingdom and its princes down to the ground in dishonor. In fierce anger he has cut off every horn of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand at the approach of the enemy. He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire that consumes everything around it. Like an enemy he has strung his bow. His right hand is ready. Like a foe he has slain all who are pleasing to the eye. He has poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of daughter Zion. The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for daughter Judah. He has laid waste his dwelling like a garden. He has destroyed his place of meeting. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festivals and her Sabbaths. In his fierce anger he has spurned both king and priest. Stay close to the one who went around doing good. To be human is to suffer. No one gets an exemption. Lamentations keeps company with the extensive biblical witness that gives dignity to suffering by insisting that God enters our suffering and is companion to our suffering, writes Eugene Peterson in his introduction to the book of Lamentations. The book, as the name suggests, focuses on the sorrow, sadness, grief, pain, loss and tragedy that the people of God experienced during the exile. Our circumstances may be different, but our suffering is just as real. The writer laments how the once great nation of Israel has gone into exile because of her many sins. She's stuck between a rock and a hard place, lost everything, massacres in the streets, starvation in the houses. As we read today's passage, there seems to be very little hope. It's all about judgment and suffering. The writer says, is any suffering like my suffering? That is often how we feel when going through difficulties and trials. He writes, My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They've come upon my neck and the Lord has sat my strength. He's handed me over to those I cannot withstand. The picture is of his sins being like a great heavy yoke around his neck, weighing him down. He is weary and burdened by them. This is the experience of exile, judgment and immense suffering. The physical exile lasted approximately 70 years, but there was a sense in which the spiritual experience of exile continued. Thank God that Jesus came to announce that the exile was well and truly over and that you need no longer go around weary and burdened by sin. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the secret of doing good. Stay close to the one who went around doing good. Hand over your burdens to Jesus and receive his rest. Take his yoke upon you as you learn from him, from his gentle, humble heart because he is the source of doing good. Thank you, my Lord and my Saviour, that you take the yoke of sin from me and remove its heavy burden. Thank you that when I am yoked to you, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Help me today to stay close to you, to minister in the power of your Holy Spirit, and like you, to go around doing good. Pippa adds, Titus 3 verse 14 says, Our people must not live unproductive lives. I wonder what God thinks is productive in our lives. Life is busy. Choosing what to do is hard. 
In God's upside-down kingdom, something we think is insignificant is probably the most important thing to God.